Welcome to Church of the Rock from Winnipeg. Stay tuned to this week's thought-provoking message from Pastor Mark Hughes. How many of you have seen at least one of the Raiders movies or Indiana Jones movies? How many have seen them? You, so you all know it. You remember many of you in 1981 when the movie came out. Here it was. It was a $20 million movie that did $250 million at the box office. That's a quarter of a billion dollars. But if any of you are thinking, you're wondering, you know, Pastor Mark, I think you're too old to pull off the Indiana Jones thing. I got news for you. They are producing an Indiana Jones number five that comes out in 2019. And when it hits the theaters, catch this, Harrison Ford will be 77 years old. So don't tell me I can't pull this off. <laughs> they haven't even started filming the movie. And they've already got the poster done. You'll have a look at the poster. You'll like this. <laughs> Com coming to a senior's home near you in 2019. And so here's what's fascinating is, is the two greatest unfound treasures of archaeology. Do you know that both of them are biblical? One of them is the Holy Grail, and the other one is the Ark of the Covenant. And of course, the Holy Grail, it was the, co the quest of, of, of the King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, and of course, Monty Python and his knights, right? Uh, <laughs> neither of them found it. Actually, both of them are actually fictitious. You do know that, don't you? Especially Monty Python, but they both actually are. Actually, someone said the reason that the Holy Grail has never found, been found is because no one is brave enough to take away Chuck Norris's favorite coffee cup. That's why. <laughs> You know, I know you think I have a thing about Chuck Norris and, and the Chuck Norris strokes, but I mean, is it just me? Look at him. Is it just me, or does he look suspiciously... <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm just saying, right? Here's what you need to know about the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail is a myth. The Ark of the Covenant, on the other hand, is the real thing. And we're going to talk about it. And so I'm going to be Professor Indiana Jones today, and I'm going to give you a little lesson about the Ark. We, we brought it, by the way. Uh, we found it. Uh, actually, <laughs> this is not the real one. Uh, this is a replica. This one is made out of styrofoam, not pure gold. But it does have gold paint on it that we got from Canadian Tire, and I think it looks just as good. <laughs> Here's the story of the Ark of the Covenant. It goes back to when the children of Israel went into the wilderness and they went to Mount Sinai and Moses received the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were written by the finger of God. They were written on tablets of stone. And then the, the Jews were instructed to actually build an ark much like what this looks like, with the cherubim on top, and this was the mercy seat where the blood of the sacrifices was poured, and then the tablets went into the Ark of the Covenant for safekeeping. Now, the Ark of the Covenant is more than just a storage container because it has something to do with the presence of God. You will remember that when the children of Israel came into the Promised Land, they carried the Ark, and it was always to be carried by these poles on the shoulders of of the, uh, high, of the priests. Of, and so what happened when they came into the Promised Land, you'll remember this, they, they stepped what, in the Jordan River and the rivers divided. They went around the city of Jericho carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and guess what? The walls came tumbling down. They went into battle carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and guess what? Their enemies were defeated. So what happened was that it was not only a symbol of God's presence and God's power, but it was also a symbol of the worship of the Jewish people. And so what Moses and the people were instructed to do was to build a tabernacle. And the tabernacle was really a tent, but a very elaborate tent. And this was where their sacrifice and their worship took place. And so there was the outer court and then the inner court where the priests went and ministered. And then there was what was called the Holy of Holies. And that was where the ark was, behind a curtain or a veil, and that's where the ark was. And so for 40 years in the wilderness, everywhere they went, they picked up the ark, carried on the priest's shoulders, and they went to their next camp. They set the whole tabernacle up, and they did this every time they moved. After 40 years, they went into the promised land, still carrying the ark of the covenant, still ministering and worshiping in the tabernacle. And they did this for another 400 years. And we find King Solomon, who was King David's son, and he was given the commission to build God a house, to build a temple. 
So he builds a temple. We know exactly how big the temple is because all the dimensions are in scripture. So here's a little diagram of what the temple looked like. Uh, Solomon's temple, there's the, the outer court where the, where the altar was and where the sacrifices were made. And then you go into the inner uh, court and then the Holy of Holies was in, it was in the very back. And so this temple existed in Jerusalem for some 330 years and, and things went relatively well during those 330 years. But in 587 BC, some of you know your history, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon attacked Jerusalem and he destroyed the temple. And so then we have some bad years where there's for you know 70 years, they're not even there, the Jews aren't even there, and Nehemiah came back and he tried to rebuild the temple, and other enemies kept on coming and attacking and desecrating what they were trying to build. And so this went on for actually several hundred years. 20 years before Jesus was born, a brand new temple was built, and it was King Herod. King Herod was called Herod the Great because he was a great builder. He built castles and he built all kinds of things. And for the Jewish people, he decided to build them a beautiful, brand new, and enormous temple. And so it's called Herod's Temple, and here's a little bit of a diagram. You see Solomon's Temple, the size of it. Look at the size of Herod's Temple. Go big or go home was Herod's motto. And so this was the, the, the temple that existed in Jesus' day. Now here's what's sort of fascinating about this story. The Ark of the Covenant was never, ever in Herod's temple. In fact, in Jesus' day, they hadn't seen the, the Ark for five or six hundred years. The last reference of it is in 2 Chronicles, some 622 BC. It had been gone for, for centuries. I find this interesting. Jesus never once mentioned the Ark of the Covenant. Where was it? Where was the ark? And that's the big question. Where, where was the ark? And then, of course, Steven Spielberg, he thinks that it ended up by the pharaohs taking it to Tanis and being buried in this city. And now, of course, we know that the U.S. government has it. It's stored in this crate right here. And, <laughs> and it's in Hangar 51 in, Nevada, in the Nevada desert, somewhere in that warehouse there. That's probably the least likely of all theories. Now, here's my question for you. If I actually knew where the ark was, would you want me to tell you? Because I, I do know. No joke. I actually do know where the ark is. I'm not kidding. Do you want to know? Okay, I just wasn't sure if you were interested. I could move on. But, but we actually know where the ark is because the scripture actually tells us. So if you kind of keep reading, a lot of times you figure this stuff out. And if you keep reading, you actually know exactly where the ark was. In the book of Revelation, we find John. He is caught up in the spirit and he gets a vision of heaven and, and he describes this vision of heaven. And in Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, this is what it says. It says, then the temple of God was open. Say it with me in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. It says that the temple in heaven is where the ark of the covenant is. You're saying, how did it get there? I didn't say I was going to tell you how it got there. I just was going to tell you where it was. So we know from scripture that the ark is in heaven. No, I don't know how it got there. So we mystery solved. You can all go home. Or I, or I could just keep talking, which I think I'll do instead. <laughs> so this is what I'm going to do this morning. I'm going to, I'm going to give you the reasons why I think Jesus was the raider of the lost ark. And here's my three points uh, up on the screen. He, number one, he raids the temple. Number two, he rescues the hostages. Number three, he releases the captives, just like in the movie. And so what we're going to do to find this is we're going to find it in Matthew chapter 27. We're going to read from verse 45. And this is some amazing stuff. You need to listen carefully as Jesus is hanging on the cross. This is what is happening. Verse 45. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. And the rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and save him. Jesus, when he had cried out again with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn from 
in two from top to bottom, and the earthquake and the rocks split, and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after the resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. Now this is an amazing picture. There's a lot in this, and we're just going to deal with a few things. And the first thing I, I want to point out to you is that, that Jesus was the raider of the temple. Now, Jesus had actually been to the temple, Herod's temple, before when he was 12 years old. But the first time that he went as an adult, the first time he went with his disciples, do you remember what he did? He was not the meek and mild Jesus that we are used to. He went into that temple and he saw them selling goods and merchandising. And he saw the money changers and he was aggravated. Now understand that the money changers, what they were doing was people would come to worship from all over the world and they bring their currency. And what they would do is they would say, oh, you can't use that currency here in the temple. You have to exchange it for Hebrew, Hebrew currency. And they would rip these people off. Just like when you buy American dollars, you know all about this. <laughs> and so they were getting this terrible interest rate, exchange rate on these, on these funds. And when Jesus saw that, can you imagine if he went to Fargo today, he'd be so mad. <laughs> and, so, and so Jesus pulls out a whip. He fashions a whip, right? He fashions a whip and he starts flashing it and he starts overturning the, the tables. And then he says this. He says, my house shall be a house of prayer, and you have made it a den of thieves. And you see this righteous indignation that was in him. And then he made this bold statement in this raid of the temple. Then he said this. He says, you will destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in, in three days. And that was an extraordinary statement for him to say. And, of course, he was referring to his body, but there's also a double reference going on the fact that the temple was going to be destroyed and the temple was going to come to an end and temple worship was going to come to an end and that was the whole purpose of his death. That's what's going on here. In fact, Jesus said this, most assuredly I say to you that not one stone of this temple shall rest upon the other. Forty years later, the Roman Titus came and he sacked the temple and he destroyed it and he commanded his men to dismantle the entire uh, temple stone by stone. Now, how many of you have been to the old city of Jerusalem? Have some of you been there? There's a few hands. And you have seen the ruins of this. And I'm going to show you a picture of it. Now, what we have here, that big wall there, is the retaining wall of the Temple Mount. That's not the temple. That's just the retaining wall. And the, the temple was up on top of that. And these stones here that you see are actually the, the temple stones that the Romans dismantled and pushed over that wall. Not one stone is rested upon the other where it originally was. The amount of effort and man hours that went, the amount of anger that they had in dismantling this temple was extraordinary. And of course, that was buried for hundreds of years, and that's, that's an archaeological dig. And you're down some 40 feet up, up below grade. And when you walk in there, and all of a sudden, anybody that ever doubts that the scripture is accurate needs to see this. And you look at that, and you're blown away. Here's the picture of, of Kathy and I walking away from it. You can see she's having a holy moment. She's got her hand up in the air, and she's saying, unbelievable. Of course, I'm having a big laugh. I've got a Chuck Norris joke on my mind, and I'm just having trouble getting out of my brain. And so the first thing he did was he raided the temple in his, in his earlier part of the ministry. But when he's hanging on the cross, he says something very unique. And it, and it says that the temple was torn. The veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. It was split right in two. I explained to you that on, on all three temples were the same. You have the outer court, the inner court, where only the priests could go. And then the Holy of Holies, where only the high priests could go. The high priest and the high priest alone was allowed to go into that Holy of Holies. And there was a veil. And the veil separated the inner court from the Holy of Holies. And the reason was, was the Ark, at least in the olden days, the Ark of the Covenant was in there, and it separated man. 
Because the Ark of the Covenant, if you go read about the stories of the Ark, you realize there was extraordinary power represented with the Ark. And people had to be careful how they touched it and how they handled it and what they did with it. And people who handled it inappropriately got hemorrhoids. Go read about it. It's true. So you want to be careful. And then there's that story, of course, of David. He's all excited. And he's he finally got the ark back from the Philistines. And he's bringing it back to Jerusalem. Do you remember this story? And it was on an ox cart. And the ox cart was rumbling down the street. And it hit a pothole. And it was about to fall over. And what happened was Uzzah, one of David's capt captains, he reached out his hand to steady the ark. And the moment he touched it, what happened? Boom, he was struck dead and fell to the ground. Why? Because you don't just mishandle the ark like that. And David had forgotten that the ark could only be transported by those poles on the shoulders of the priest. And he had made this, this huge blunder. And you see, David had never seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. He didn't know about the scene <laughs> where the Nazis looked into the ark when they shouldn't have touched it and they shouldn't have looked in. You remember the scene? Where they looked in, we didn't do it tonight, but they did it, and the Nazis melted. Ah! Ah! Some, someone says the reason they can't find the ark is Chuck Norris found it first, and he stared at it, and the ark melted. <laughs> There's a Chuck Norris joke about everything. You know that, don't you? Absolutely. So what happened with that veil? What was the deal with that veil? See... You know, when we think of that veil, be honest with me. How many of you, when you think of the veil of the temple, you think of like a wedding veil or, or maybe like a piece of cheesecloth? Come on, track with me. Oh, really? There's just like three of us that are that goofy that we thought that? And we think, oh, the veil was torn from top to bottom. Oh, ooh, it's ripped. Let me tell you about the veil of the temple. The veil of the temple, according to Jewish writings, was 42 feet high, 30 feet wide, and was as thick as a man's hand. The priest... Once a year on Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur or, or, or the Day of Atonement, he would, he would take the, the blood of bulls and goats, and he would take this, this blood, and he would pass through the veil. Now, not supernaturally, it was layers, and he would actually navigate his way through the layers of the, of the veil, like a labyrinth, until he was into the Holy of Holies. And only once a year, and only the high priest could go in there, and he would bring the blood of these sacrifices, and then he would pour it on the mercy seat on top of the ark, and the sins of Israel would be forgiven. But when Jesus died on the cross, and when that veil was torn from top to bottom, this is what it says in Hebrews chapter 9. Look at the screen. It says, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And the picture that the scripture paints was that everything we saw in the Old Testament with the sacrifice of blood and, of bulls and goats was merely a foreshadowing or a type of the moment when Jesus himself, whether it was physically or spiritually or in heaven, it's hard to know. But what it says, what he went into the holy place and he poured his own blood on the mercy seat once for all. And that's why the veil was torn from top to bottom and God was saying, as Jesus did, and he hung on the cross and he breathed his last and he said, it is what? Finished. It's done. Temple worship is done. The sacrifice of bulls and goats is done because he entered the most holy place shedding his own blood once and for all. The greatest thing that ever happened in history. So that's the first thing that he raids the temple. The second thing is this, is that he rescues the hostages. Now, in Indiana Jones, in every one of the movies, he's busy trying to find the artifacts, right? He's trying to find the ark or different things. But he's also got a major distraction. And you know who it is? The damsel in distress. And there's always a damsel in distress. And in the first one, Marion Ravenwood, she's constantly getting taken hostage by either the, the, the Egyptians or the Nazis. And he spends most of the movie trying to rescue her. And of course, when you watch the movie, who do you identify with, the damsel in distress or the hero? I know who I identify with. <laughs> I dressed up like Indy. <laughs> we, we all do. We all want to identify with, with the hero. But here's what I'm here to tell you. You're actually not the hero in this story. You're actually the damsel in distress. You are the hostage. And the Bible tells us that we're all hostages of sin. 
that we're all slaves of sin. And that we can thank Adam and Eve for that, uh, that when they uh, committed that sin in the garden. You know, here, here's what I want to explain to you. You're not actually punished for what Adam and Eve did. You're punished for what you do because you can sin all by your lonesome. You don't need their help. But you did inherit something from them. You got a sin nature from them. And uh, that's what we deal with. And that's what we struggle with. The fact that we are hostages, every last one of us, are, are hostages of sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, there are none, none righteous, no, not one. But you see, we live in a culture today where people are denying the existence of sin. Have you noticed this? They all deny the existence of sin. And, you know, we say, well, you know, you're not really sinful. You're just maybe misunderstood. And that man is really inherently good. Really? Man's inherently good? If man's inherently good, how do you explain the 50 million people that Joseph Stalin killed in the 20s and 30s in Russia? How do you explain the, the 17 million people that, that Adolf Hitler killed uh, in Nazi Germany? How do you explain in Rwanda the, the Hutus and the Tutsis that ha, were literally at each other's throats and, and killing one another, their own neighbors with machetes, and 2 million people lost their life? in that civil war, neighbor against neighbor. How do you explain the car bombings and the suicide bombings and the, and the ISIS and the beheadings? How do you explain the, the violence that we see every single day? How do you explain the internet theft and the identity theft and the crime? And how do you explain the, the two million children that are sold into the sex trade every single year, sometimes by their own parents? How do you explain any of this? When you travel the world, you want, you, one of the things you discover, that people don't believe they're inherently good, but they are inherently religious. And everywhere you go, I've been on five continents, you find people that actually set up idols and try to find ways to atone for their sin because they all seem to know that there's a problem in their heart and in their soul and they're looking for help. And it's only our culture that tries to pretend that it doesn't exist, that we don't really need any help. I don't know about you, uh, but I grew up Catholic. Anybody grew up Catholic in the room? So you'll understand this next couple of minutes. I, I grew up Catholic, and I lived in a constant state of guilt. Uh, you know, guilt is the gift that keeps on giving. The Jews invented it. The Catholics perfected it, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I actually, you know, appreciated the Catholic upbringing because one of the things I knew being brought up as a Catholic was I knew I was a sinner. And they reminded me regularly. And as a Catholic, one of the things we did was we went to confession to confess our sin and to kind of get absolved of it. My non-Catholic friends could not understand their teenage buddy, me, going to confession every week. They said, really, Mark? You go to confession? What do you say? What do I say? The same thing I say every week is what I say. I do the same stuff every week. See, here was the thing. As a Catholic, I had this sense that I was sinful, and I had a sense that maybe, just maybe, I was going to hell, and how bad could I be? I wanted to be just bad enough that I didn't go over the edge and end up in hell. And I had this constant sort of dread and fear of hell that we don't have today. We don't talk about it today. People don't fear hell. They don't even talk about it. And they say, oh, Pastor Mark, you shouldn't talk about hell. Well, maybe we should talk about hell a little bit in church, right? You know, it was D.L. Moody, the great preacher 100 years ago, he used to say this. He said, he used to tell preachers, when you preach on hell, there should be tears in your eyes. And Charles Spurgeon, who was a little bit before his time, he used to tell his preachers this. He said, when you talk about heaven, your face should light up like the sun itself. And when you talk about hell, well, your everyday face will probably do just fine. <laughs> <laughs> There's this story about years ago about the Plains Indians. And there was this uh, tribal chief. And uh, he was a very fair, but he was a very stern man as well. And if someone was caught doing some crime, they should be punished because the law was predominant. And so someone in the tribe had been stealing pelts and they couldn't figure who it was. And so uh, what he did was he set out a trap and they caught the person and the person who was stealing the pelts turned out to be his own mother. And so he had said that the person that got caught was going to receive 20 lashes and now he had a dilemma on his hand. His elderly mother was about to receive the, the 20 lashes. And the tribe all gathered around for, for the execution of the punishment, and they wondered, what's he going to do? Is he going to love his mother and forgive her? Or is he going to execute punishment on her? Because if he just forgives her, then what about his law? Then his law doesn't mean anything. 
And on the other hand, if he, if, he, if he punishes her with the law, then does he really love his mother? I mean, she could die. And so just as, as the, the, the punisher was about to whip the old lady's back as she was tied to a pole, the chief said, stop! And everybody looked, wondering what he was going to do. And he took off his shirt. He bared his own back. And he went and covered his mother like this. And he took the 20 lashes in the place of his mother. And that's exactly what Jesus did on the cross for you and me. Is that he went to the cross and he took the lashes so that we wouldn't have to. And that forgiveness, that price of forgiveness for our sins came at a huge cost. So number one, he raids the temple. Number two, he rescues the hostage. And just to wrap this up, number three, he releases the captives. I want to show you one last thing in closing here. And it's, uh, it's in verse 52 of our text, and this is what it says. So it says, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, and the, and the earthquake and the rocks split. And then it says, and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the grave after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, most of us miss this when we're reading this. You think, wait a minute, who are these people? that are crawling out of the grave. And, you know, these people have been dead for years. As many of these, these saints that have been dead and gone for years and years, and all of a sudden, after the resurrection, Jesus wasn't the only one that came out of the grave. And all of a sudden, there's all these people, you know, uh, walking dead thing happening. You've got zombies all over, but these people aren't zombies. They're real-life people. There's Uncle Joe. He's moving kind of slow at the junction. He's been dead for 25 years. What's up? I'll tell you what's up. You see, in the Old Testament, nobody went to heaven. Nobody. You don't see any reference of people dying and going to heaven. This is what it says. It says, and he died and was gathered to his people. You say, well, where did he go? You go read Luke chapter 16 and you find out. In the under part of the earth, there was two compartments. One was the place of torment. One was the place of paradise. Remember Lazarus and the rich man? And the rich man went to the place of torment. And Lazarus went to the place of paradise. And there was a gulf between them, so you could not pass between them. Well, what happened? It tells us in Ephesians 4, he who ascended first descended into the lower parts of the earth and led captivity captive. He went down there during those three days and he gathered up all of those Old Testament people and brought them. And when he rose from the grave, so did they. And it says they appeared in the city of Jerusalem. I mean, how creepy was this? But that's what was going on. And then when he went and descended to heaven, he took them all with him. You see, he released the captives that were waiting to go to heaven with him. See, Jesus said this. He said, no sign will I give you except for the sign of Jonah. And as Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the great fish, he said, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And you see, Jesus put it all on the line with the resurrection the resurrection is what it's all about. It's what separates Christianity from everything else. See, religion ends where Christianity begins with the resurrection. See, Buddha is dead, Muhammad is dead, and Krishna is dead, and Confucius is dead, and Elvis is dead, but Jesus is alive, for he has risen from the dead, and he lives forevermore. He has risen! He has risen! Let's stand together. I want to ask you this. Have you made a decision to be a follower of Christ? And if you have not done that, what better time than today to do it? Now, I'm not asking, have you been to church or been baptized as an infant? That's not the question. The question is, have you made a decision? Have you had the definitive moment? If you were to die tonight, do you know if you go to heaven? That's who I'm talking to. And so with every head bowed, every eye closed... And again, I won't call you forward, single you out. But if you'd like to make a decision so that you know that you've received the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to just slip up your hand right now. Just, it's just between you and me and Jesus. Just take a moment, slip that hand up right now. His hand's popping around, up, uh, around the room right now. Said I wouldn't single anybody out, so let's all pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the work of the cross. I thank you that you paid the ultimate price for my sin and then you rose again on the third day and you forever live 
to be my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give Jesus a hand, shall we? God bless. Have a great Easter. See you next Sunday.